Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to another episode of BHBA Family Law Presents Direct Examination. Along with Lauren Youngman from Youngman Reichstein, I'm Dan Bemmel, financial advisor and certified divorce financial analyst. During each episode of our show, we explore our guests' personal and professional history and dig into meaningful legal topics. Please continue to join us for our upcoming episodes, always at 12.30 p.m. live on Zoom on the first Wednesday of the month. Upcoming guests, Kimia Klein on March 6th, followed by Adam Lipsick, Stephen Yoda, Evan Itzkowitz, and more. Lauren. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, as a housekeeping note, you will receive your MCLE certificate shortly after the program. Please take a moment to complete the survey that's included with your certificate. Our sponsor for the family law section is White, Zuckerman, Warsawski, Luna, and Hunt. White, Zuckerman, Warsawski, Luna, and Hunt provides a wide variety of resources to complete almost any project, large or small. They also provide traditional accounting and tax practice services. We invite you to contact them to discuss your specific accounting needs and learn how they can be of service to you. Thank you, Lauren. All right, today we are joined by Michael Trope. While primarily a family law attorney now, his legal career includes criminal, probate, breach of contract, wrongful death, and of course, very complicated family law cases with all the attendant publicity and media coverage. It's really great timing that we're talking to Michael today, only a few days before the Super Bowl. As some of you may know, family law is actually a second career for Michael. He was first famous, very famous, as a football agent, representing Heisman Trophy winners, first round draft picks, and future Hall of Famers like Johnny Rogers, Archie Griffin, Earl Campbell, Tony Dorsett, Ricky Bell, Lawrence Taylor, and Anthony Munoz, among many, many others. So, Michael, first, thanks so much for joining us. Hey, not a problem. Thank you. All right, well, let's start there. Uh, do you still watch, and do you have a pick for the game on Sunday? Well, I don't have a pick, and I will be honest with you that in the last uh, – Six Super Bowls, I've lost five out of six bets. Okay, so, well, then who do you want? We'll bet the opposite. Don't don't take my advice. Yeah. All right, so has football changed a lot since you were an agent? Well, I think it has. The game, of course, when I first got involved back in the early 70s, was a much grittier game. Uh, it was more violent. Um, there was a lot more mud cuts blood on the players um today it's almost like compared to back then it's almost like watching ballerinas do you think that do you think the sport is healthy does that make the sport or the business healthier uh it could be but i'm sure part of it has to do with trying to make uh create rules <clears throat> that make the game safer for the health of the players and so I was curious, if you were the commissioner today, uh, what would you change tomorrow? What changes would you make, the, make to the game uh, now? Well, you know, I mean, I like the game the way that it is. Uh, I think that uh, it's good that the game has progressed and changed the rules in order to protect the health of the players and the safety of the players. So uh, the only thing that I would change, not being specific, would be just to look for additional ways to make the game uh, safer for players and uh, so that it's less susceptible for career uh, ending injuries. Michael, when did you decide to become a sports agent to begin with? Well, I was always a sports fan, but um, back in 1971, I think it was, or 72, probably 71, I was watching the Nebraska Oklahoma football game at the home of a friend with a bunch of buddies. And um, Oklahoma and Nebraska were the number one and two ranked teams in the country. This was that year's national championship game, so to speak. And there was a player on Nebraska's team named Johnny Rogers that ran this incredible punt back, 72 yards for a touchdown. It's on YouTube. If anybody wants to go look at it, it's quite an exciting run. And when he got into the end zone, after zigzagging back and forth across the field, I said, boy, I'd sure like to be his agent. Everybody started laughing at me saying, yeah, yeah, why would he hire a college student like you? And actually, um, that was the germ uh, uh, that 
started the whole thing because then I decided, okay, I'm going to go uh, approach that guy and see if I can become his agent. That's how it started. So, so what, what was the story? What the happened? You met him. What happened? You what were you thinking on the way back from Nebraska? Were you was that it? Did you think well, you had it in the back? No. What I did is um, I bought a student standby airplane ticket uh, uh, after the the season ended. He was a junior going into his senior year, and I flew back to Lincoln, Nebraska. I drove to the practice field. I got a map on how to get to the campus, and practice was just ending. And the only player that was left on the field was Johnny Rogers. And there was a long line of people. They were getting his autographs because at that point he was the most famous player on the team. And so I stood at the end of the line. I was wearing a pair of blue jeans and a t-shirt. And when I got up to the front of the line, he said, do you have something for me to sign? And I said, no, my name is Mike Trope. I came out here from Los Angeles. I'd like to talk to you about being your agent. And he looked at me bewilderedly and he said, how old are you? And I said, 20. And he said, what's your birthday? And I said, December 24th. And he said, man, I'm older than you are. So, but he said, you see that bench over there? Go sit there. I'm going to go take a shower. And when I get out, uh, you know, I'll sit down and talk to you. And so that began essentially a dialogue that lasted for the better part of seven or eight months. Mm. Seven, eight months later. Uh, he played his last game in the Orange Bowl, scored five touchdowns against Notre Dame, and uh, and hired me. Uh, after he hired you, was your family supportive of, of this career path? Well, I'm not going to say that anybody at the very beginning was overly supportive uh, because uh, it kind of looked like a pipe dream at the beginning. Uh, but yeah, I mean, uh, I wound up representing the Heisman Trophy winner, and then that cascaded into a 10-year uh, a uh, career that turned out to be you know, quite a good ride. What was it like being an agent back then? Well, it was very, very competitive world. It was a very, very doggy dog cutthroat business. And, um, and of course, at the very beginning, the co competition uh, didn't take me seriously because they said, mm -hmm that 20 year old punk kid. Uh, but after getting five straight Heisman Trophy winners and representing multiple first round picks, um, I began to be taken very seriously by my competition. Is there any similarity in client management uh, between being an agent and being a family law attorney? Well, you know, professional athletes are used to being recruited, catered to, having their rear ends kissed. And so, uh, you know, there's a whole mentality when you're representing those folks uh, that you're really catering to them. And I don't believe that they believe that they need you as much as you need them, if you understand what I'm saying. Whereas in family right. law, uh, I think that um, clients, uh, realize that they need the lawyers a lot more than the lawyers need them. And so, I mean, there, there's a psychological issues, there's handholding issues, there's being able to communicate with your clients, but uh, representing the professional athletes in the era that I was representing them for 10 years, I was not a lawyer at that time, uh, uh, is, was a whole different uh, ballgame. So how did you market yourself and attract new clients if if they were used to this approach? Did you did you take a different approach? Well, what happened is the first client, uh, who was Johnny Rogers, uh, the reason that I believe that he went with me is that he told me he didn't want to have some 50-year-old guy with a bunch of gold chains hanging around his neck being his agent. And he liked the fact that he was actually six months older than I was. Um, so... Uh, that's what kind of got me in the door with with him. He was kind of a rebel. He won the Heisman Trophy. And what happened is that after I represented him, I was on the map, even though I was only 21 years old. And as a consequence of that, it made it much easier for me to get the next player and the next player. And so 
five years later, all of a sudden I had a client list of 50 some odd players mm -hmm. uh, um, that were very successful. And then it became obviously easier and easier. What about on the tactics side, the negotiating tactics as an agent against the teams, uh, especially during contentious high dollar battles, are there any similarities there uh, or anything you learned there that is carried over to your family law career? Well, yes and no. I mean, yes, to the extent that when you're negotiating with a general manager of a team or the owner of a team, you have to know your audience, which is an audience of one in terms of trying to negotiate a good deal for the player. And of course, the money back when I was in the business was a fraction of what it is today. I mean, back when I first got into the business, if a player made $100,000 a year, he had broken the bank. And when uh, in the late seven, uh, in the mid eighties, when I got a player, a million dollar a year contract, I mean, that was considered enormous. Whereas today uh, it's chicken feed. Um, but the, um, the negotiations were entirely different because even though they were contentious and even though the teams didn't want, uh, you know, to give away all of their money, they selected the player in the draft. So they really wanted the player. And my biggest ally during all of those negotiations was, was the head coach or the head coaches on the team. Because when they drafted a first round pick, they wanted to get the guy signed as quickly as possible to bring him into training camp and get him acclimated and part of the team. So it's, it, it, there are similarities uh, but there are also a lot of uh, dissimilarities. We know that you eventually ended up becoming a lawyer and a family law lawyer. So right. when did when did that uh, transition away from being an agent start? When you know it, it seems like you you just walked away. What's well, the story there? What happened is that when I was a child, um, from the time that I was eating Gerber's baby food, um, I was being told that I was going to become a lawyer. Uh, my father was a lawyer. My uncle was a lawyer. Um, they had their own law practice. And I think there was just a presumption from the time that I was a small kid that I was going to become a lawyer. Uh, and then what happened is I took a diversion when I got into the agency business and started making money and went on this wild, exciting ride when I was in my early 20s. Uh, that took me away from uh, uh, the pursuit of a legal career. After I had been in the agency business for about five or six years, I then started wondering, boy, what it would it be like to be a lawyer? Uh, do I have the chops to try a case in front of a jury? And I started having these thoughts that if I never became a lawyer and if I never tried it and if I never knew if I could present a case in front of a jury, uh, that I'd be an old man on my deathbed saying, why didn't I ever give that a shot? And so uh, that and an overwhelming sense of, um, of guilt that I felt because I had in one respect disappointed my father by not going into the legal profession, uh, the convergence of those things led me to go back to law school at night uh, after I'd been in the agency business for five or six years and pursue uh, becoming a lawyer. So why write a book about it, about being an agent? What are your two books that you've written, Necessary Roughness, um, on the way out? Did you feel like you were exposing secrets or betraying the industry? Was that a cleansing exercise to kind of get the business off of you? Why, why do that at all as the transition? Well, it was in part a catharsis. Uh, in part, I thought that there was a lot of uh, entertaining and funny stories uh, that were in my book, including the first chapter, which was about a negotiation that I had with the owner of the New Jersey Generals football team, who at that time was a fellow by the name of Donald Trump. I spent a couple of days with at Trump Tower uh, negotiating a complicated deal before he uh, was obviously president of the United States. It was back in 1984. Um, and there was a publishing company that approached me 
and offered me a, a nice uh, advance to write the book. So a combination of all of those things uh, led me to write the book. So it was, you know, just like I wanted to tell the story. And did you ever consider uh, going back to football, maybe even as a lawyer or working on any legal issues related to football when, after you were in law school? Uh, not really. When I quit the sports agency business, cold turkey, I decided I didn't want to do that anymore. And I quit when I was pretty much on top in that business and I didn't look back. Now, that having been said, uh, I represented an NFL player who had been charged with kidnapping. I represented uh, numerous other uh, uh, professional athletes uh, in at first contempt hearings, child custody cases. Uh, and in fact, my introduction to family law in terms of my own practical experience, when I was an agent, I probably was tasked with the responsibility for going around the country about 20 different times hiring a, a child custody and paternity lawyers because I had many, many players uh, who had paternity cases uh, filed against them all over the country. And so I was actually, you know, I, I'd hire somebody that was a lawyer in Atlanta because one of the paternity cases uh, would be filed against somebody that was on the Atlanta Falcons uh, or the Seattle Seahawks or the Cincinnati Bengals. So I actually, even though I wasn't performing any legal work, um, I was out interviewing lawyers and educating myself on what lawyers did in paternity actions before I ever became a lawyer. So let's jump back to the beginning of your story. You talked about it a little bit already that you were, you know, pressured from day one, or you know, it was just kind of the ethos that you were going to become a lawyer. Um, and of course, that involves family law pioneer, your father, Sorrel Trope. And to borrow another football analogy, so many of our guests, maybe fully half, come from Sorrell's coaching tree, either working with him or for him and definitely against uh, him. Uh, but none have had your perspective, both as a son and a colleague, of course. Um, so what do you remember most? What do you remember about your dad's business growing up and the practice of family law as a kid? Well, first and foremost, um, and I want to make this really clear, uh, the value of my father to me, more so than wanting to be in business with him, was wanting to have him as my father. And so, you know, that's my relationship. I looked at him as a father, not as somebody that I could go into business with. If I roll the, uh, the, the reel back to when I was a kid, my father uh, uh, was during, there was a time period where he was not a family law lawyer. He did all kinds of uh, uh, legal work and whatnot. And he'd often have clients come over to the house uh, while, uh, even from out of town while he was working on a case that he took one case all the way up to the Supreme Court. And, uh, uh, but I remember, my hero when I was a kid uh, was Babe Ruth. Now, Babe Ruth was dead before I was born, but as an avid baseball fan, when I was six, seven years old, the, my hero was Babe Ruth. And there was a, a movie uh, starring William Bendix who played Babe Ruth, uh, and he even looked like Babe Ruth. And when I was a kid, I watched the movie, The Babe Ruth Story, starring William Bendix. And in my brain, the guy that I saw on the television screen was Babe Ruth. And one day uh, uh, at our home, uh, my dad had his client. It was not a divorce case. It was some other kind of a business uh, dispute that the fellow was involved in. Uh, but there was William Bendix. And I remember that the next day when I went to school, I told all of my friends that Babe Ruth had been in our house the night before. And so, you know, uh, the, you know, those are the kinds of memories that I have in terms of uh, my father. My father represented a very wealthy woman uh, who, Laura Scudder of Laura Scudder Potato Chips. And I remember he'd come back from visiting her at her plant and he had a convertible car and the top was down. And other than 
where he sat in the driver's seat, the entire car was filled with potato chips and mayonnaise and all kinds of different uh, things that were made by Laura Scudder. Um, so, I mean, there, were a, there was a lot of experience that I had where I met clients and I saw my dad interacting with clients and whatnot, but it had nothing to do, it had more to do with the fact that I was just his son and, and I was around. Yeah, so so as a kid, what was your relationship like with your dad? Were you close through that period? My father, when I was a child growing up, was the kind of guy that um, you could always rely upon. He was, I was a wild kid and always figuring out ways to get into trouble. And he was always there figuring out ways to save me. And so that was the relationship that I had with my dad is he was the stable rock that I knew that I could always rely upon. And that's the relationship, the true relationship in terms of what I had with my dad is that I always looked up to him uh, uh, and for good reason, because, and it wasn't, oh, he's a great lawyer. Uh, he could do a great job in court. No, it was, he was my dad. And I knew that I could always rely upon him, no matter what the circumstances were. How did you deal with your dad pushing you towards the law? And, and as you said, talking about it every day since you were eating Gerber baby food. <laughs> well, um, I kind of, re you know, when I had the opportunity or the idea of becoming an agent, mm -hmm. uh, that was kind of an act of rebellion. Um, but the only reason that I was able to be a lawyer is because my dad instilled in me a degree of confidence and also instilled in me the idea, don't think about doing something, do it. You'll never have a, dr uh, a dream come true if you don't have a dream. And so uh, uh, I would have never been a sports agent and I would have never been a success had it not been for the upbringing that I had from my father, not because he was a great lawyer, because he was a great father. How did you do things differently or approach parenting differently with your own girls? Well, um, my father was uh, very strict in, in many respects. And, uh, uh, and in some respects he was rigid and he was, an authority, a nice man, but he was also an authoritarian. And so when I had kids, I kind of said, well, I'm going to go easy on my kids. I'm not going to, I'm not going to do, raise them the same way that my dad raised me. Uh, and um, because I thought that I was more enlightened, you know, being a product of the sixties and whatnot. And so I remember that I had a, a room in my house and I told my kids, You've got to respect the rest of the house. But when you go into this room, you can do anything you, you can write on the walls. You can do anything you want in this room. And the room had vaulted ceilings. And about five years after I gave them permission to do that, that entire room, there was not a square inch of the walls in the room that were not covered with some form of graffiti or nasty comments about me, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and uh, uh, so I, I was not, uh, uh, I, I will say I was not as good a parent to my kids as my dad was to me. Hmm. What I'm kind of curious to unpack what put you off as being a, a, being a lawyer growing up. I mean, you talked about what you did, but why do you think you wanted to, to move away from that when you were young? Well, a couple of things. Number one, my ego wanted me to be able to do something where, the, where I wasn't under the domination and control of a successful father. Also, uh, you know, my father introduced me to the world of monitored visits uh, when I was a small child. Now, it didn't have anything to do with him, uh, but now that both of my parents are deceased, I can talk about it more, more freely. Um, when I was a young kid, around five or six years old, my mother, who was a strikingly beautiful woman, tried to kill herself. And I found her body. 
Uh, now, fortunately, uh, her stomach was pumped and they were able to uh, uh, revive her uh, and save her life uh, from that attempt. And, uh, and I remember when I was a kid, my father took me on visits to see my mother. And for a number of years, those visits were on Saturdays at a, at a mental hospital and a sanitarium. And so uh, I do have, you know, those kinds of memories. Uh, and I, I, the suicide attempt was uh, postpartum depression. Uh, it wasn't like I saw my parents uh, fighting and it happened at a very young age. But um, as I reflect back upon family life uh, back at that time, uh, uh, you know, it, they weren't the happiest of memories. Uh, now, subsequently, my father went on to uh, uh, marry his current wife, who's been my stepmother for the better part of almost 60 years and had a wonderful, loving, long-term relationship until the very end. And so from that perspective, I saw, you know, a very uh, good uh, uh, and loving and warm uh, familial uh, uh, scenario. But in terms of going back to my early childhood, uh, those memories were not exactly uh, the, the happiest in terms of um, the marital relationship, if you want to call it that. Did that experience going through the, you know, those visits and, and everything with your mom, does that change the way that you think about cases now, think about custody relationships or visitation relationships? Well, it does, you know, my father, had he wanted to back at that time, probably could have easily prevented me from having any relationship with my mother because my mother was in a sanitarium uh, uh, before they had all of the modern, wonderful drugs to deal with all of those uh, depressive ailments. You know, she was, I'd go visit her and she was making moccasins with the other, you know, patients. Um, and so, you know, when I hear the trials and tribulations of a lot of my clients that are going through child custody issues, um, of course, I have a better understanding of some of the things that they're going through and the hurt feelings and the pain, because I experienced it uh, on a very, very dramatic level. Uh, so I do believe that I've got a bit more empathy, perhaps, than somebody that had a happy uh, childhood that never witnessed or experienced that kind of thing. And was that did that inform your choice to to or or push you away from family law? What was the plan when you did finally go back to law school and decide to try a different career, fulfill the destiny, or fulfill the the uh, you know see what it was like was the was it pushing you towards family law or pushing you away from family law well when i became a lawyer i had no intention initially of doing any family law um i, I wanted to be a criminal defense lawyer and in fact i, I was a criminal defense lawyer uh, for a period of time and i did criminal uh, jury trials and for a time period i was actually with the public defender's office and then uh, as my practice began to diversify a little bit, instead of just doing criminal jury uh, trials, it was a civil wrongful death case or a breach of contract case or a will contest case. I mean, I did a, a wide variety of things. And then I wound up doing a child custody case for a particular client that evolved into a civil lawsuit as the result of an incident that took place at a child custody exchange uh, where I wound up uh, having a jury trial downtown. And I think it was 1995 or 1996 uh, in which um, I uh, obtained a, a jury verdict for the plaintiff who was a father who was emotionally distressed as a result of what happened at this child custody exchange. And actually, after that case, that's when I started getting a lot of family law cases. 
uh, and, and nasty child custody cases. So it was more organic. Uh, I had that case. It evolved into a kind of a sensational uh, jury trial uh, uh, that was uh, somewhat unique because you don't see a lot of those. And then, uh, and then I started getting a bunch of family law cases. Can you tell us a little bit about that jury trial? Sure. Um, the the judge who presided over the jury trial was Victor Chavez, who later became the presiding judge downtown. And I represented, I'm not going to mention names because I defend people in the community, uh, lawyers and litigants, but um, I represented this fellow who had been married to a very wealthy woman, and uh, she was obstructing his visitation with his son. And mm. uh, uh, so I got this very specific court order and he picked his kid up from school on a Friday afternoon. And then he called me up and he said, wow, I've got my kid. I'm so happy. I'm going to spend the weekend with him. And then 20 minutes later, he called me up and he said, my house is surrounded by my wife's security guards and they're yelling profanities at me and telling me uh, to release my, my son. And I said, call the police. And he called me 15 minutes later. It's about six o'clock in the evening. And he said, the police are here and I can't find the court order. They want to see the court order. And so I had the wonderful task of driving up into the Hollywood Hills. And I arrived at the, at the end of the cul-de-sac where his house was. It looked like a scene from Hill Street Blues. There were cops all over the place. These, these uh, SUVs with all these retired cops all over the place. And the bottom line is I, I, I showed them uh, the court order, showed uh, the Sergeant uh, Whittington the, the court order. And, uh, and he, as he was looking at it, uh, my client's uh, ex-wife said, oh, there's his scumbag lawyer. I want them in the same jail cell together. And, uh. and the police officer looked at the order and he looked at her and he said, lady, this is the boy's weekend with his father. You guys have 15 minutes to clear out, or we're going to start making arrests for disturbing the peace. So it literally took about 15 minutes for all these people to get in their cars and, and leave. And then my client decided to go up to Santa Barbara uh, with, uh, with his son after everybody left. And I, I said, thank goodness I get to go home. And then I got another phone call from the West Hollywood Sheriff's Department my client was being followed by a couple of people and got into a high-speed car chase and with nine millimeter Glock revolvers and oh my the sheriff station and the sheriffs uh, detained the two people that were following him to check their weapons permits, enabling my guy to, to essentially get away. And one day before the statute of limitations ran, he allowed me to file a lawsuit for intentional infliction of emotional distress. And we had a jury trial downtown and uh, got a, a plaintiff's verdict and an, a 12 0 vote for punitive damages. And um, so that case is what ultimately led to other people that had child custody problems uh, calling me on the phone and retaining. So in those early years, you obviously scratched the itch to try a case see if you could do it, be in front of a judge, uh, to whether it was in the public defender's office or in on the civil side, how did it compare to the, to how were you thinking about it, comparing it to being an agent? Obviously you don't have the same glitz and glamor, but were you happy in those early years that you made a change? Well, I was because I felt back at that time at the ripe old age of, you know, 29 or 30, when I quit the agency business, I, I, I felt that I had done whatever it is that I had set out to do in that particular business. And the business was a real cutthroat, competitive, dirty business. Uh, and so um, uh, I, I will tell you that I was in New York two times representing the number one overall pick in the NFL draft in front of the crowd. I'm sitting there or standing there with my 
client, either Earl Campbell or Ricky Bell, who were the two number one overall picks. Um, and there was a certain exhilaration to that. However, I will tell you that the first time I represented a criminal defendant in a courtroom where the only people that were in that courtroom was the judge, you know, the bailiff, the court clerk, and the jurors. And I heard those words after the juries deliberated, not guilty. Whole different feeling. Even though there was nobody there, there was no applause. I was representing somebody that was just a common alleged criminal. The feeling of exhilaration hearing a jury validate my presentation of the case by, by coming back with a not guilty verdict was just as exciting as standing up in New York at the NFL draft with the number one overall pick. Is it equally exciting uh, with our, our uh, non-jury family law cases to have the judge rule in your favor? Uh, not, not really. And, you know, I, I've, I've had cases where, you know, I went in there and I battled it out in front of the judge and, and then the judge ruled in my favor and, and said, but, and here's, you know, here's uh, my logic for this uh, ruling. And the things that the judge was saying as to why he ruled my favor were not even on my radar, you know? And so I'm sitting there saying, oh my God, I won for all the wrong reasons. Uh, <laughs> And so, you know, it, it's a it's a different ball game. I remember uh, not too long after I had stopped doing jury trials, although I've done a couple uh, over the years since. But I was down in Torrance in front of a commissioner Raggins, and it was a child custody case. And I and I said, Your Honor, this is a case that cries out for 50-50 custody. And 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 Commissioner Raggins put his hand up and he said. He goes, slow down. He goes, would you turn around for a moment? And I said, sure. So I turned around and he said, do you see the jury box over there? <laughs> I said, yeah. And he goes, is anybody in there? And I said, no. And he said, it's just you and me. I don't have a hearing aid and I don't need one. Just talk to me. And so one of the things that I had to learn when I made the switch from doing something in front of a jury in, in, in the family law business is that it's a jury of one and you have to really know your audience. And so, you know, all of the, the drama and whatnot, you know, really uh, didn't mean a whole heck of a lot. So uh, you transitioned into family law. You're doing lots of family law cases. What was it? What was it like, and what led you to join Trope and Trope? Well, um, in 2001, um, I uh, actually had a phone call with uh, uh, she's now a judge, Ann Kylie, um, and she was with Trope and Trope and said boy, you know, we could sure use you over here. And I said, ah, I don't think my dad, you know, wants me, you know, to be in the firm. You know, I, 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 I don't know if the space is big enough for the two egos. And, uh, and certainly uh, uh, my father's um, capabilities as a family law lawyer far exceeded mine. And so she then called me back and said, no, you know, you got it wrong. Uh, and then I received a phone call from him and my partner at the time was Patrick DeCarolis. We were in business together. And, uh, and, and I told my dad, I said, well, I'm not going to, I'm not going to leave Patrick in the lurch. And he said, Hey, both, let's have a meeting and I'll bring both of you guys over. And so, um, we went to trope and trope and were there from, uh, July of 2001 until December 31st of 2006, uh, at which time I left trope and trope and then he followed me. But the, the reason for leaving Trope and Trope, it's kind of a funny little anecdotal story, but I went to a movie one time. And um, and at that time, seniors had said, you know, 55 years of age. And I was about to turn 55 years old. And I said, wait a second, I'm working for my daddy? 
and I'm 55 friggin' years old, and I'm called a senior when I go to the friggin' movie theater. And so uh, I went to my dad and I said, hey, I know this is gonna sound strange, but before my birthday, I'm out of here because uh, I need to do my own thing like I did before, and I don't wanna be uh, a senior, uh, so to speak, uh, working for my pop. Did your personal relationship with your dad change over those five years through working together? You know, uh, at that time, uh, well, did it, did it change? Uh, not really. Uh, um, you know, um, it was easier for me to be my father's son than to be somebody that worked as part of his law operation. Um, when I was just his son, he was always proud of me. When I was working uh, uh, at his law firm, uh, you know, I'm a, you know, I'm a subordinate person that has far less experience than he has, uh, and subject to, uh, you know, the, the hierarchy relationship of somebody that owns a business that has somebody working under them. And, you know, the way my dad brought me up was to do it on my own. And so he, he didn't bring me up to go to work for him. He brought me up to be able to go out and fight my own battles, which is what I've done. What did you learn um, during your time working for your father? Well, I learned uh, that my father, number one, was an excellent superior lawyer. But I also learned, number two, that he was an incredible businessman because uh, he took the family law business and figured out a way to grow it. Uh, now you have some firms today, uh, Myers Olson, Lowey, uh, uh, Hirsch Manis, um, uh, Wasser Cooperman. You've got firms now that are that are bigger uh, firms with many lawyers that uh, that have excellent reputations and are very very successful. But if you go back in those days, most of the family law lawyers, you know, were all solo practitioners or little mom and pop shops. And I think that what my father did is he figured out a way to uh, operate a successful family law practice uh, that grew and had multiple lawyers and layers of responsibility, figuring out a team approach to uh, working on cases and whatnot. And he had an amazing, although there have been many lawyers that went to Trope and Trope and then went out and started their own practices, a lot of them, um, there was also a tremendous degree of loyalty uh, that my father engendered with people that stayed with him and, uh, and, and worked for him or with him for many, many years. And so what I realized is great lawyer, great businessman, but for me, I had to step backwards and say, that's great, great lawyer, great businessman, but a better father. And I, that's what I, I didn't want to have the father-son relationship eclipsed uh, with, with a, a business relationship. When you did leave and you took on the challenge of starting your own law firm again after five years at, at, at Trope and Trope, what was different that time around? What was special about that challenge? And did, did, you, did you enjoy it at that time? Well, first, the challenge when I first became a lawyer, because back at the time that I became a lawyer, uh, people in Los Angeles knew me as this young kid that had become a successful sports agent. And so I really was typecast. It was very difficult for me to get out of the box of being an agent and transition to being a lawyer because people would say, wait a second, aren't you a sports agent? And then I'd have to explain to them, well, 
I went to law school. I took all the <laughs> classes and now I'm a lawyer. Here's my business card. You see, it says attorney at law on it. I'm no longer. And it's amazing. It took a couple of years for me to break out of that mold. Okay. So now uh, we go from trope and trope. And, and, and what happened is I went back into business with DeCarolis and we restarted up our old firm. And at the beginning, we were kind of scared because at Trope and Trope, hey, there was always business. There was a pile of business. There were always cases to work on. Um, you know, we were getting paid by the firm. Uh, we had no overhead. And now all of a sudden, we're out starting all over, going out and signing a lease and basically starting from scratch. And so there was that initial trepidation but then we got over that trepidation and uh, and things worked out. So I want to talk about one other lawyer before we move on to one of your most famous cases, and that's Earl Rogers. Okay. You wrote another book called Once Upon a Time in Los Angeles about Earl Rogers. What was the seed of that idea? And more importantly, what have you what have you learned through doing all that research and writing that book that every attorney should know and that you you've utilized in your own practice? The seed was I was flying from LA to Chicago. I had, was involved in a racketeering case. And, uh, and when I was on the airplane, I read an obituary uh, about a woman named Adela Rogers St. John's who had died, I think at the age of 90 or 92. Um, and it was a big uh, uh, article in the LA Times, I mean, a big obituary. And it talked about the fact that she had written 11 novels uh, and uh, two of them were made into movies. And one of them she had written a screenplay for, and it was loosely based on her life and the life of her father, who was a womanizing, drunk trial lawyer, but who was, whose reputation back in the early 1900s was that he was a better lawyer drunk than any other lawyer sober. And uh, how he had raised her as a single father uh, and she had gone to court with him and, 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 and whatnot. And so uh, uh, I, I, when I got to Chicago, I went to the library and I started doing research and I, 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 I read a book that she had written and, and I, but, Somehow, I just, some of her stories were so fantastic uh, about her father that I didn't believe them. And so one day I carved out some time. I went down to the library because back in 1903, 1904, news coverage of trials were covered by 11 different daily newspapers that were in Los Angeles. And that was the form of entertainment that people had was to read the newspaper about all these salacious trials. And people would line up in lines to try and get a seat in the courtroom for some of these salacious trials because that was the version of going to a rock concert is that you go watch some great murder trial uh, with all kinds of stuff going on. And um, there was this one particular case and I didn't believe that her account could have been accurate because it was so dramatic. And it took me four days in the microfiche looking through 1903, I think it was, uh, uh, pages of the LA Times, and I found the trial coverage. Wow. And what I found, uh, Earl Rogers, uh, uh, according to his daughter, had pulled a gun out on the key witness in the courtroom to prove a point in front of the judge during a cross-examination. And so I was reading the LA Times and I came across uh, Earl Rogers cross-examination of this uh, Harry Johnson, who was the key witness. And I didn't see anything about a gun being pulled out. And I said, did she just make it up? I wonder if he even got a, an acquittal. And so I kept reading, I kept reading, and then I got to the closing arguments and the headline in the LA Times was Rogers pulls gun in courtroom, makes the Buffalo Bill show look tame. So and he did it. Through the years, 
there were inaccuracies in her uh, uh, remembrance of what had happened, but he did pull out a gun. He, he pulled did. it out during his closing argument. And so I then researched 14 or 15 of his key cases uh, where um, by comparing different newspaper accounts of what happened and they were, the newspaper accounts were very detailed. It was almost like a court reporter. And um, as a result, uh, uh, over a period of time, I did the research on these different cases uh, that were all one amazing case after another. Um, and, uh, and then I, I, you know, I wrote the book, but that's, that was the germ uh, uh, was seeing the obituary. Uh, and this guy was um, a horrible drunk. <laughs> and he died at the age of 52 as a broken down drunk. The postscript is she wrote, his daughter wrote a book called A Free Soul that was made into a movie. And the character Stephen Ash was the Earl Rogers character. And he was defending a criminal in the movie when it was made into a movie, it was Clark Gable's first major role who played the criminal. And the lawyer who played the Earl Rogers character was Lionel Barrymore. And he won the <laughs> Academy Award that year for the best actor uh, because she had envisioned a scenario where her father died with his boots on in the courtroom, not in a motel somewhere. And in the movie and in her book, the character who was an alcoholic lawyer gave this impassioned closing argument in front of the jury. And then as he walked away from the jury, he dropped dead of a heart attack in the courtroom. And so, you know. Spoiler. <laughs> yeah. um, all right. Well, I, that's a wild story. I'm, I think I'm going to have to read the book. Um, <laughs> it, we only have uh, a, a little bit of time left, and we have to talk about one of your most well-known cases, um, and that's the Krikorian case. Um, we have the code sections underlying some of the child support issues and the materials. Um, tell us about that case. What made it special? Well, obviously, it was a high earner case with the statutes and whatnot, where you deviate from the guideline presumption to figure out what the support is. Okay, but getting beyond that, um, uh, uh, Lisa had been represented uh, by Steve Kolodny in a case, uh, and then years later was contacted by the FBI and told that uh, her phone calls back at the time that Mr. Kolodny represented her had been wiretapped by Anthony Pelicano and that uh, her phone calls with her therapist wiretapped by Anthony Pelicano, and that her telephone conversations with a mediator wiretapped by Anthony Pelicano. And so um, I filed a essentially a motion in the family law court uh, to set aside the result of the child support order from years before asked that a default be entered for the amount that she originally asked for, which Kolodny had asked for a huge fortune, uh, asked that they be sanctioned, uh, a la the Schlesinger Disney case, uh, and not be allowed to put on any evidence, and that we be granted a default judgment retroactive to the date that that original order had been made. And so the net result of all of this mess was a two-day uh, uh, mediation uh, after we had had some court skirmishes and whatnot with um, Judge Black, who very sadly is now deceased, used to be the presiding judge uh, downtown. And, and we ultimately reached uh, uh, a resolution that was quite lucrative uh, for her. Um, so there were family law issues, uh, civil litigation issues, uh, criminal law issues, uh, uh, and um, uh, uh, and she had been represented by, uh, there were very, very fine lawyers uh, that had been involved on both sides of that case uh, for pre before I ever got involved in the case. Um, and one of the lawyers, uh, uh, you know, who was connected with uh, Mr. Pelicano uh, uh, wound up being uh, prosecuted, convicted, and served a uh, 
a prison sentence, uh, as did Pelicano. But so that was the, I, I mean, what I'm doing is I'm condensing, you know, into one minute, uh, what was years of litigation. Did your practice or business <laughs> change after that case? You know, uh, I got to tell you, I've never really understood exactly why or how I get legal business. There's a lot of people that are a lot more sophisticated than I am in terms of running their business. Um, uh, sometimes I'll get an ex-client who refers one of their friends. I've had um, referrals sometimes from the other side of the case where the litigant that I went against called me up after their case was over and said, would you represent my sister? Um, and then I've had people where I, I don't even know where they came from. Uh, so I can't tie uh, any other than that, that very, very first uh, 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 jury trial where I got the husband a seven figure uh, uh, jury verdict uh, for the emotional distress at a child custody exchange. That did generate some immediate and even that was friends of the guy who were going through divorces with other family members and whatnot said, oh, I heard you just got so-and-so, you know, this jury verdict. And that stimulated uh, uh, getting business. But I, I promise you, uh, uh, whether it's foolish or not, I've never actually sat down and done any type of scientific uh, study in terms of how or where the business comes from. Is practicing law still fun? I like, it seems so much fun to you. Do you still really enjoy it? Frankly, the last time I had a lot of fun, although it was anxiety ridden, was in 2013, I had a client who was a, a high profile producer. Uh, and after I did his divorce case, he was sued for uh, domestic abuse under this civil code statute. And we had a jury trial uh, downtown uh, uh, and um, Judge Alarcon was the judge who presided over that case. And I was nervous as heck because there were eight women and four men on the jury. Um, and, uh, and had he lost, it was, you know, he'd have been cleaned out um, and uh, that was the last time I had a lot of fun, especially when the jury came back 10-2 for a defense verdict. Um, because it was a jury trial and because I, I had to look at 12 faces and try to figure out where the sale was, uh, who I had to convince. Um, and I thought maybe my personality might have something to do with the result where, you know, I could go in front of a a judge in a family law case, and they could care less about my personality. And probably are sitting there wishing, I uh, wish this guy would get the hell out of my courtroom. Um, uh, so that was the last time I, I had a lot of fun. Um, and, um, uh, and of course, COVID uh, kind of changed everything. It's like, I look at making a court appearance on Zoom, like buying a Xerox copy of a painting that you're gonna put on the wall of your home, not a lithograph or a seriograph, a Xerox copy. And, uh, uh, and I just find it really difficult and maybe I'm just a dinosaur, but I just find it really difficult going on a Zoom screen with all these other people that are up on the Zoom. And then if I can hear what's going on, uh, try to make an argument uh, to the judge uh, as to what should happen with respect to the uh, item that's before the court. And so there's just something about, and maybe it will return to a, 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 to a more uh, normalized uh, pre-COVID kind of atmosphere, but there's just something about the process that has a degree of detachment as compared to what it was like during that pre-COVID era. Well, with our with our last minute, 
Um, we have a question that we ask um, everyone on the show and what uh, final advice or what piece of advice would you give to either your younger self or generally to new attorneys just starting out in family law? Uh, to be true to yourself, to believe in yourself and uh, uh, not listen to the backbiting and the jealous comments from uh, people that might not be the nicest competitors uh, and try to take the high road um, and uh, and just do the best that you can do. And uh, I, and I, I think that's that's the only advice that I would give. All right, Michael, thank you so much. Uh, it's really too bad that we're out of time. Everyone listening, please mark your calendars and uh, join us for our next episodes. They're all at 12.30 p.m., we have Kimia Klein on March 6th, Adam Lipsick, Stephen Yoda, Evan Itzkowitz, and more uh, coming up afterwards. Um, thank you to Genna, Rin, Jose, and Belinda at the bar, the Family Law Executive Committee, which is currently led by uh, Ava Jahan Bash and Ashley Kwan, uh, and of course, our section sponsor. Uh, most importantly, Michael, thank you again uh, for being here and for sharing so much with us. Hey, thank you. I wish we could go for another couple hours. Well, we'll have to have you back. <laughs> See you later. Bye-bye.